as you may or may not know, in uh, November of 2013, Doss Police Department, under the direction of Chief Brown and under city leadership, uh, began the process of issuing 3,200 downed officer kits to all of our officers who have public contact. These kits contain state-of-the-art hemorrhage control equipment that has been proven uh, to save lives on the battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan. So we've chosen to uh, adapt many of those principles uh, for civilian use and equip our officers with a kit that has the potential to allow them to uh, save each other's lives as well as to make our community more safe. Uh, the contents of the downed officer kit, which I'm holding here, include a uh, specialized modular bandage used to control moderate bleeding, uh, a special operations forces tourniquet, sometimes abbreviated as soft T, and a roll of quick, quick clock combat gauze. These items together represent, like I said, state of the art in hemorrhage control, and all of our frontline officers are now equipped with this kit. As you all reported very well, uh, over the weekend, one of our officers, police officer Joshua Burns, was shot three times in the line of duty. Uh, his fellow officers deployed their downed officer kit uh, and used some of the contents. Uh, to help save Officer Burns' life. We believe this to be the first use of the downed officer kit in the Dallas Police Department. We're obviously uh, proud of our officers, grateful to Chief Brown for his foresight in allowing us to put these kits out there. Uh, I'm certainly grateful to the people that I work with and for, the UT Southwestern Medical Center and part of the hospital, who in partnership with the police department here, uh, run the tactical medical support team for the city of Dallas, and obviously city leadership, uh, First Mary and now AC, uh, to allow us to help get these kits out. So with that, I will take any questions that you have. How much the, the kit cost, and um, what was used the other day? So obviously we buy the kits in bulk, so we get a pretty good deal, but you can take an, an average cost of around $50 an officer, uh, $50 to $60 an officer. Um, and these, the, both the quick clock combat gauze and the tourniquet in the kit were used on officer burns. What would have happened had the kit not been available? Uh, that's hard to say. We try not to foreshadow uh, in the medical business, but you, it's certainly safe to say that when you um, take care of trauma patients like I do, uh, the bottom line is that the earlier you get control of their bleeding, the better off they are. So there's no question that these officers use the contents of the kit for exactly its intended purpose, which was to control Officer Burns' bleeding. It allows him to arrive at the hospital where then surgeons and nurses can do the things that they do in a trauma center uh, to help stop that bleeding for good. But you get the patient, in this case our officer, to the hospital in much better shape than he would have if, if his hemorrhage would have been unchecked. Can you run out? I think that's certainly a possibility. I guess talk about what the loss of blood does uh, in, terms of a, in terms of a traumatic event um, and you getting someone there who is still bleeding profusely and hasn't been addressed as opposed to it being addressed and that person being somewhat stabilized when they arrive. Sure, no question. When, we, when you talk about uh, trauma surgery and taking care of patients who are injured, blood is the currency of life that we use. It, does, it is the entire reason behind when uh, patients have bad outcomes. Most of that is from unchecked hemorrhage. And if you think about someone who, is, um, who has gunshot wounds like Josh had, basically you get to the point where the, the bullet does some damage, but what does most of the physiologic, causes most of the physiologic problem is the unchecked hemorrhage and the shock that follows. Basically, by allowing the officers the technology, knowledge, and equipment to help stop that process, you get the officer arriving at the hospital in much better physiologic shape than they would have otherwise. What would have been done before you had these kits? What, what was the procedure for taking care of an officer? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think before we had these kits, we had a very rudimentary um, first aid kit in the car so that sort of came with the vehicles. So much more designed to protect our officers from bloodborne pathogens, sort of the problem they saw in the 80s when uh, communicable diseases and things like that. So it's things like gloves and gowns and that sort of stuff. But what we've transitioned to is a kit that really allows the officers not to wait for anyone to show up. The officer is um, every bit as well trained as, let's say, I were standing right there in immediate hemorrhage control techniques. It's the same thing that I would do, which is put a bandage on, put a tourniquet on if the bleeding severe enough, or use a specialized combat gauze if we get to that point. And I think what's important also is not what we would have done in the past, not just what was done Saturday, but we are entering an era of unprecedented threat. You look at the Boston Marathon bombing, you look at any of the active shooters that have happened in the United States over the last 12 months, we're entering a period of threat that we have never seen or planned for. 
And by putting these kits on the street, not only is the job of being a Dallas police officer more safe, but the community's more safe. Because our officers won't just use these kits on each other. If we come up upon an injured civilian, someone that's had a problem, these officers are going to use these kits on them as well. And that's what makes the community a lot more safe. Doctor, is it becoming like uh, the use of defibrillators where before, you know, you might see them rarely, now you see them in all the schools, you see them in a lot of public places because uh, of the rate of heart attacks and strokes that happen, defibrillators being used. Is it getting to the point where these kind of kits need to be readily available in schools and other places so that that can be a, a triage, so to speak, right off the bat? So that's a fantastic question and a great point. And there are many people who say, if we're going to really make a difference in um, – mortality or the death rate after some of these active shooters and we can't even wait the time it takes for the police officers to get there and we have to use what's what's called what you refer to was public access access defibrillation this is public access hemorrhage control and we really have to teach everyone out there it has to be every bit as second nature uh, to the community to stop bleeding put a bandage on as it is to reach out start cpr and grab the defibrillator so great question so uh, every um Police unit or officer have access to this right now every single one. So 3,200 of our, you know, we're 3,700 officers and change. 3,200 officers, all the officers that have public contact have been issued one of these kits and the training that goes with it. The training is a little bit of an ongoing process. They've gotten the initial training. And as we cycle through the department through our two year continuing education cycle, additional hands on exercises are planned. So have been trained already in our plan for the future for the officers that, have, that are going through that training. Alex, you said that the tourniquet was used. Can you tell me where it was used and how it was used? It might be interesting for the public to know where they would use it. The tourniquet was used on Officer Burns' leg, uh, the, where he was, uh, where he sustained the gunshot wound to his leg. Uh, a tourniquet is a great device. Got a lot of bad press uh, after World War II when we were using them incorrectly. Um, now that we've learned a lot from our colleagues in Iraq and Afghanistan and around the country, you know, we know how to safely use an emergency tourniquet. And pre-hospital providers all over the country, not just police officers, are beginning to learn how to reincorporate the tourniquet back into our arsenal of pre-hospital hemorrhage control equipment. One of the things about the tourniquet that's unique is that it can be taught to a layperson to use. So you notice these are police officers that have very basic first aid training. They can become expert at the use of these devices with a very small amount of very high profile, high power, high impact training. Is there a difference between regular gauze and your combat gauze? Absolutely. So the quick pot combat gauze uh, is a gauze product that's impregnated with um, uh, an agent that helps your blood clot. So it's actually super specialized gauze, and we're one of the few police departments in the country where every officer carries this specialized product. It was an investment that the city chose to make in our police officers, and Chief Brown chose to invest in, in these officers' safety, and I promise you, this is the first time, but unfortunately, I think we'll probably be hearing of other cases where it's used. This is truly um, cutting-edge, life-saving technology. Now, you, order, you guys have ordered a special order. Is there anything comparable that, that regular citizens can get at your Walgreens, Walmart, anything comparable so that they have one of those lawnmower accidents and somebody's bleeding, uh, bleeding profusely or something related to that, a cutting, stabbing, anything? That, is there anything out there that they can get that's comparable that will help them at least uh, control the bleeding before they get to the hospital. Sure, there are products that are out there. I would encourage the public that if they're going to go out to purchase a, a hemorrhage control product, that they make sure they talk to somebody who really has some knowledge about the topic, because there are some products that are out there that are less effective. In fact, there are some products sold out there under the Quick Clot brand name that are less effective. If you're going to go and you're going to purchase the product, you need to make sure that you have the actual Quick Clot Combat Gauze, which is interesting to in this one, but well, I'll get you a roll of it downstairs. Um, the Quick Block Combat Gauze comes in a green package uh, and is actually um, the product to use. Where, is, where are these kept? Are they kept in the squad cars? Or so at this point, uh, we're leaving to the individual officer's discretion about where to carry them. Some of the pieces are bulky. Uh, if you notice on my duty belt, I have the tourniquet on a holster on my gun belt, so it's easy to reach and access all the time. Where's that active? Yeah, sure, it's right here. Now you're going to get my waist on camera. I shot a rod last night, but step on the front of the table, please. Thank you. So you can see the target carrying here on the duty belt in the holster. We're leaving up to individual officer's discretion as to where they're going to carry that, but they will um, they'll have it on them or close by. The thing about this equipment is it's not something that can, you know, it doesn't do you any good if you have it in the car, right? So you got to have it close to you, like these officers did. Um, and I think that the 
the proof of concept occurs this weekend when we have these officers who are able to, you know, reach out, grab this kid, go immediately to the side of their wounded officer and get his hemorrhage under control long before the arrival of anyone with any, you know, professional medical training. Do you know if they have in the car or if they have it on their person? I don't know where the, the equipment was, no ma'am. How much the training take? Uh, we, we, the training is occurring in four steps right now. Uh, we're using a series of roll call training videos that can be played at the station level. Um, that's sort of uh, step one and two. Step three, we've got the kits available um, at the stations for the officers to look at so they don't have to open their own. They can look at the contents and get familiar with them. And step four will be the final step, which is that scenario-based training that we're doing in our uh, recurring training cycle. So all told, all the officers have had the introductory training. It's been available on our internet for some time. Um, and they've all got the introductory training prior to some of the Kennedy Memorial events. Kids were issued prior to that time. And they'll, over the next two years, they'll all be going through the scenario-based training model. Are there other police departments that use this? Accessible there are other. There, so if you... Uh, to go back and sort of get some of the rationale behind this, uh, last year a group of trauma surgeons, the Major City Police Chiefs Association, and the um, America, sorry, sorry, America College Surgeons, Major City Police Chiefs Association, uh, the FBI, and some other FEMA, some other agencies came together to write a document which was now, which has been colloquially called the Hartford Consensus. If you Google the Hartford Consensus, you'll be able to find tons of information or reach out to me and I'll send it to you. But the public consensus tried to lay out some of the rationale from a both a trauma surgeon and a law enforcement perspective at improving our hemorrhage control efforts in the United States. Since that Hartford consensus was written and published over sort of uh, summertime 2013, many, many major cities have chosen to try to go the route that we're going uh, based on the work of that Hartford consensus. And I was a part of that group. Um, and, and certainly the police department here needs to be commended for giving me the time to go and be a part of this discussion. But since the Harper Consensus was published, somewhere in the neighborhood of 38,000 police officers across the country in many major cities, Los Angeles, Phoenix, Boston, Dallas, San Antonio, Chicago, Washington, D.C., all are either being, Tampa, don't let me forget, Tampa, Florida, um, all are either being equipped or are in the have been equipped with very similar kits. The contents may be, you know, there's a couple different brand names out there, but 38,000 officers equipped and trained since the publication of the Hartford Consensus. It's an amazing number. And it's really what I believe, and many people believe, will make our communities more safe as we move forward. Do you know which officer applied um, the kit to find your doctor? Do you know how long it took to, after the kit was applied until you know, paramedics arrived? A, a matter of minutes, I understand. But it, you know, those are crucial minutes. So if you, um, our response time here, in the, in the city of Dallas is under five minutes. But when you have a hole in a major artery or a hole in a major blood vessel, those can be pretty crucial five minutes. Um, and so that's, these kits are designed to bridge that gap between the time someone's wounded and the time that our professional fire rescue paramedics show up to help take care of the injured officer or one of our citizens. These are the two, these are the two pieces of equipment that were used on Officer Burns. The, obviously the Special Operations Forces turn to get quick clock combat calls. You'll see the front is designed to slip over the wounded extremity. It's a simple tightening, tightens down itself. Tighten it, and then you just crank the windlass until the bleeding stops. We obviously aren't going to crank it down because it's not the most comfortable thing for it. But that's as, that's as hard as it is, really. It's just a matter of getting used to the equipment and knowing when to, how to use it under stressful conditions. There's a lot of debate about how long you need to train people to do this and how much training they need. I think Saturday shows you that our model works pretty well. You're able to get this tourniquet, get the equipment out, and deploy it under stressful conditions. I can't think of anything more stressful than watching your partner get shot uh, and deploy the equipment properly under stressful conditions. It was a great performance by our officers doing exactly what they were trained to do. Can you find that off above where the wound is? Absolutely. Absolutely. Between the heart and the wound. 